Imagination is the opposite of ignorance, and this is why acting and drama is so important, because it's at the heart of compassion. It's the heart of having the imagination to know what it feels like for someone else. And if you don't have that imagination, you are a psychopath. You know, you don't, you psychopaths don't understand what it's like to be someone else, what someone else might be feeling. And so in some ways, acting is the opposite of being a psychopath. <laughs> and, and I think that's where it has value. Filmmaker Magazine presents Back to One with Peter Rinaldi. Dominic West is an actor. He sat down with me in New York City to talk about the work. Is there a typical way you begin your process of getting into a character? Like, you get the script, what's the first thing you do? God, this is going to be very interesting because I've never really talked about this or never really thought about it myself. Uh, what's the first thing I do? I Well, inevitably, in choosing, in choosing to do any part, it, it, it stems from you having a... Uh, an identification with something in the script, something that you feel you understand, something that you feel uh, you can bring your experience to that, that intrigues you, that turns you on, you know, and you think that uh, um, either you haven't done that, <coughs> haven't done that before, or explored that before, or or um, or that touches on something that you feel deeply, and and. Uh, yeah, I think that's where it starts. It's where Peter Brook, in his book about um, directing, whatever it was called, you know, he used to say, "What are we left with at the end of a piece of theatre? Are we left with is our life changed? Is our um, uh, you know is the world changed?" And no, very often it's just a it's just a tiny resonance. It's a tiny echo that that maybe we forget about completely, and on rare occasions it, it resonates for more than a couple of days, you know. But it's very rare to do more than that. And I suppose it's that resonance that, that's the starting point. It's that, it's that thing that makes you realize that uh, it's something that you can do rather than anyone else in particular. Maybe this will get into how you really began all this. Your mother had a theater, is this right? And she put you in plays? Uh, really no, she didn't have a theatre. She, she, she. I mean, she had seven, has seven kids, and uh, so I don't know how the hell she found time. And we, we lived in the suburbs of an industrial town, ex-industrial town called Sheffield in England. And, um, and I don't know if it's true now, but uh, certainly in the seventies there was, there was a, a th quite a thriving amateur theatrical uh -huh. scene, and. Um, and so she was part of a, a theatre company in, in Sheffield, oh. which was made up of all sorts of amateurs who, who did obviously had other jobs, and um, and it was um, and she used to I don't know they put on a play a year or something like that or maybe two, and uh, she just I suppose she always acting interested her and it's what she wanted to do and and she never got the chance to because of her circumstances growing up and. And so this was her way of doing it. And over time, she managed to play quite a lot of uh, the shake, you know, probably all the Shakespeare yeah. heroines, and yeah. you know, played some really serious, juicy parts. And uh, it was an amazing education for me to grow up in that. And and I remember when I first did acting professionally, and I was interviewed, and they said, "Is there anyone else in your family act?" And I said, "No, no, no, I'm the only one." And she went, she she went, "I beg your pardon." <laughs> 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 And quite naturally said, you know, you didn't come out of nothing, you know. Yeah. Um, so it it was a it was called Theatre Focus, and it, I remember it was run by a wonderful woman called Frida Meller, who was a, a secretary in a building uh, company, and um, uh, and but had this great love of of Shakespeare, and she she would direct and produce the these shows, and and um, it was a really sort of Honest, direct uh, for a uh, form of the art of acting and of drama. Uh, you know, anyone could watch it. It cost nothing to go and yeah. see. It was it, all the proceeds went to charity, and anyone could be in it really. Yeah. And there was something very pure about that, which I, I think has stayed with me all my life. And that, in a way, that's my definition of what theatre and, and acting is all about. Is is this? Um, 
access to all and 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 no nothing particularly glitzy about it you know right. and so she used to get so there was she had seven children and so when they needed crowd scenes or they needed fairies in midsummer night's dream or <laughs> she'd just get us in and we'd prance around and um and then when i was 9 they did uh a sort of re- review of plays from the interwar years or post-war years, I can't remember what it was, probably post-war, and um, they did a scene from The Winslow Boy, I don't know if you know that play, and it was a Terence Rattigan play, and it was made into a film as well, But and it's a, a true story of a boy who's, um, who's accused of stealing something at his school, and uh, at a military school, and his parent in the sort of 1920s, and his parents... Um, take it all the way through the high court to the house of lords to mm. to um what's the word clear his name which was you know an interesting case and and terence rattigan wrote a very good play about it and so it's an amazing part for a nine-year-old boy and i was nine and i played it mm. and um loved it and that sort of kicked me off really so when you start out that young it, it kind of like happens in an organic way for you to just be kind of motioned into the craft right you know i always find it interesting when when actors start out as kid actors and you're not necessarily the traditional kid actor that has you know success early on no <laughs> you're no, just not in at a all. little thing not at all no but it's still the same thing for me because it, because it it's not this thing that as an adult you decide to do it's like it it grew in you kind of over time from when you were a kid yeah and i just always wanted to know when you get to be an adult and you act you have these your experiences are from when you were young. It's not. It's not from like even if you do go to acting school, the foundation is from actually just doing. Yeah. And I just want to know like how this makes you different from somebody who just starts it as an adult and has this thing. It could be bad or good. It could be that you're not able to get over certain things because they were they have deep roots in there or habits even yes. as a kid. Yeah. Can you just explain that or talk to me? Yeah, about yeah. That? No, that's so interesting. The I, I think. Um, I, f- I found it very difficult. It's, I didn't really become a professional actor until I was 26, so I was pretty late. And uh, I f- that was partly because in those days you could get free education in England. And I, I went to university for four years, and then I went to drama school for three years. So I was a student forever, because in those days you could be. It was free. Um, <laughs> uh, and I, I suppose I had a slight problem of of taking seriously the idea that I could get paid for doing something that had always been a hobby or had always been a you know a, a passion and and um and it did take me a while to take the business part seriously and it's taken me even longer to take things like the publicity rounds the you know the um the self promotion and all that i i've always been very uncomfortable with it and i've i've always sort of discounted it as being frivolous or in, in some way not important. And I'm only now realizing it's very much part of the job and, and um, certainly in big TV shows or films. And, and um, so I think on the negative side, it took me a while to get used to that. Uh, but on the positive side, I think, and my daughter wants to be, she's 20 now, she wants to act. And, and anyone who asks me, I get asked quite a bit by young people, how do I get into it? And I, I don't really know how you do it now. I, I, you know, you can build up your Instagram following and it seems to me you can become a movie star tomorrow. Uh, yeah. <laughs> and, uh, and that's great. Um, but it seems to me that so much of the job then is about self-promotion and publicity and all the stuff that to me is nothing to do with acting. Uh, to me, acting is... Uh, in it in its purest sense, it is, is just doing something in front of another person uh, and, or pretending to be someone else in front of someone else. And, and, that, um, and there's a lot of fun in that. It's what we do as kids all the time. It's what um, I think our brains are, are sort of uh, based on. And what are those things, the copycat neurons, the neuron, the mirror neurons, mm-hmm. you know, that's how we learn to do anything is by copying. Yeah. And, and that's really what acting is. And, and so it's a fundamental human need. And I think uh, I, I think I experienced that quite purely by, by just putting on plays. And, and then later in college, putting on, you know, making short films for uh, no money. And, 
uh, you know, trying to work out how to make a film. Um, and I've always sort of said, I said to my daughter, you know, that's, that's how I did it. And, and I found it endlessly nourishing as a result. And I think it gives you a certain longevity. It's sort mm-hmm. of, at the end of the day, I'm, I don't care if, I, if I'm not famous or rich, but I really would care if I couldn't ever um, do a play again. You know, that would really, that would really be a denial of what, what I think I am. So, so ultimately, one's um, popularity becomes a secondary thing. Mm-hmm. And uh, <clears throat> that sounds a bit, you know, po-faced and, and sanctimonious, but, but I do think you can lose sight of that and that it's very tempting uh, nowadays to think that the important thing is to uh, be big in social media or to, you know, get a lot of, um, get a lot of, I don't know, following or fans or get famous as quickly as possible. And, and to me, fame always got in the way of what actually I enjoyed doing. With a character like Jean Valjean, that, first of all, people have seen other actors play. But even before that, it's a character that is, is in our world literature. It's the, this is a, the legendary character. I would just imagine these would be extra pressures yeah. on an actor. I think the pressure is, is really trying to persuade people to bother watching it. You know, they... I mean, I thought when I was approached by this, I said, well, you know, why, why would you want to make a six-part TV series? We've seen the very successful film very recently. Every, you know, everyone's seen the musical, which is still on all over the world. Why, why do we need this? Uh, and, and the answer was because we haven't had a six-hour long-form version mm-hmm. of it in living memory, or certainly not in English language. And, um, but with any of these classics... Uh, the question of, you know, will I be as good as the best person who's done this is not a question that lingers very long. It's more, um, I mean, I played Hamlet when I was about 17 at school and I haven't been able to play it professionally <laughs> since, unfortunately, which I really regret because uh, the head of the RSC, I remember auditioning for him once and he said to me, the thing about Shakespeare, or the thing about any classic role, any great role that's lasted, you know, beyond its lifetime, um, or the lifetime of this writer, um, they make you a better actor. If you act Shakespeare, you become a better actor, however bad you are, and mm. however awful and boring the production is. You just you can't help but become better. Mm. It, it extends you. It it, it uh, nourishes you. It it gives you something, and that is really not true of almost everything else that you come across. <laughs> and so, Maybe the opposite. It the diminishes opposite. Yeah. your energy. Yeah, it does. And yeah. and I've played a lot of villains and a lot of assholes and a lot of uh, not particularly likable people and and that's fun to do usually um, but actually when you have to spend a lot of time with these characters it becomes very wearing I remember one year a few years ago I played Fred West who was an English serial killer Yargo and some mm-hmm. other jerk and <laughs> and it was a very heavy year and I didn't realize until, until then if you spend Three months playing Yago, you're done. You're, that's you don't want to hang around with this guy anymore. He's a he's a he's an you know the thing about evil is it, it is dramatic to a point, but ultimately evil is incredibly banal and boring. It's yeah. incredibly pedestrian and very dull. You know, bad people are dull, and good people are actually they're not. It's not very dramatic. It's difficult to make goodness dramatic. Mm. But they're much more interesting, mm. and they're much more nourishing. And I, that's what I really noticed about playing Valjean, is, is he was great to live with him, and it was mm. great to be in his shoes a bit, and, and in some way uh, for some of him to rub off on me. And, and, and like the Shakespeare guy said, you know, you become, you feel like you become a bigger person, or you, you feel like you become a... Uh, a more nourished, your soul is nourished, and and that's a very, uh, un, that's depressingly rare that that happens. Um, but it's you know, but I I want to do a lot more because it's I'm getting old and I you know my time's running out and and I I don't want to waste that time with arseholes. You know, I want to be I want to be with interesting people. 
this segue might be a stretch, but I really believe this. Speaking of novels, I really believe, and this is kind of sad, that our great American novel is The Wire. <laughs> I mean, it's sad because it's a TV show, but it it's happens not. to no, be... No, 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 the novel, it no, to d- be no, any great novelist writing now would write TV. No yeah, question. right? No question. It's just Particularly, particularly a, a social novelist like Dickens or Hugo or David right. Simon. Right, And I, I, I'm And David saying, Simon's up there with Dickens and Hugo. Am I right? Yeah. I mean, yeah. One of the things I didn't ask any of the people that have been on the show from The Wire before, or really anybody that's been in a, in a series, and in this particular series, because I think it's so good, I'm baffled by this. How does a show that goes on for what I consider almost a 60-hour story, how does it have the same tone? No matter who the the director is, I mean, you you yourself even directed it. So it's like Simon, when he did it, is not necessarily, he only did one other show before this, or maybe two. But he wasn't, it wasn't like this experienced showrunner that knows how to... No. Right? He wasn't. No, and, and he, he was recruiting novelists. Not, not, none of the writers... That's the was other a, thing. None of the writers was a TV writer. And, you know, that's why it happened. And that, 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 you know, The reason The Wire was, in some ways, groundbreaking and revolutionary, um, it was because, for the first time in a long time, because of box sets, really, writers could write without the pressure, or without commercial pressures, or without upsetting the sponsors. Mm. And um, and what was fortuitous with the wire was that this journalist, and I love, I love writers who've been who've done their stint as journalists. David Simon always said, you know, when the people ask him, "How do I become a writer?" He says, "Well, go and work on a paper," mm. and really, that's where you learn to write. You know, where you're just churning out. Um, you know, this journalist, crime journalist, crime reporter, made the corner, um, and then made the wire and taught himself to to make television as he was doing it, um, and recruited a lot of novelists who'd never done any TV writing, and and so their approach was completely fresh because of that, and it was also. Uh, had the result that they were treating it like a novel, mm. and Dickens. Don't forget Dickens and Victor Hugo. I think they, you know they wrote they wrote their novels in installments. They mm-hmm. were they were issued right. in magazines by the week or the month, uh, and so, and but the novels of the great American novel, which I've never quite understood why everyone's so hung up about the great American novel. It seems to me there are hundreds of great American novels. You yeah. know, really great American novels. <laughs> but most of them are in the nineteenth century because most great novels yes. were in the nineteenth century. In the twentieth century, because of the war. The novel uh, was exploded by people like Joyce uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. as being something old hat, and so inevitably now the novel form is television, and that's access to everybody. Um, and and since box sets and things like HBO, where the pressure of the commercial pressure was taken off, writers could write, and 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 The Wire was one of the first shows to do that, and so that's why it has such resonance still. That that um. That it was a like a, a manumission and a, a sort of a, 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 you know it was like writers had been locked up for years and they were suddenly let out of jail. <laughs> right. Right. <laughs> when you play a character for this long, like like McNulty on The Wire, Noah on The Affair, tell me how the experience changes for you. Even if you play somebody in a play for three years, every night almost. It's still only that part of the person's life. In these cases, things keep changing, you know, in the person's life and growing and you get a new script and it's another thing. And I just want to know what that experience is like for the actor. Does it simply make things easier? Like, can you just jump right into him easier, no matter what the script is? Tell me what other things occur as time goes on. Well, the weirdest thing is that you, they start writing your life into it. Is that right? Yeah, I mean, they, they uh, I can't remember how, but in the why, you know, I was, I'd, I'd split up from the mother of my child and I was, um, you know, that it was all, they, yeah, they, <laughs> and I know in the affair, um, Sarah had in mind a completely different Noah to what I <laughs> turned out to be. 
Uh, and so essentially what happens is they start writing for you. And that's an amazing gift in one way. And in another way, it's really weird and claustrophobic and you can't wait to get out of it. Um, so uh, I, my, my, my sort of MO seems to have been a sort of antagonistic. <laughs> my relationship with writers tends to be antagonistically creative in that, you know, you just you dread reading the scripts you dread seeing where they're going to take you next and and it's counter you know it's it's nonsense because as an actor you want to be challenged in all sorts yeah. of ways but but as a human being you don't want to be put into heavily emotional um scenes that you might in some way identify with and and that that of course is what the writers always do and it, you know you're a very lucky actor if you if you have great writers writing for you but Generally speaking, I dread it and I hate it and I rail against them and, and tell them I want to off the show as quickly as possible. I, I always have. I was trying to get off the wire from day one and I've been trying to get off the affair. And, and it's only when it ends that you, you go, oh, well, oh, I missed that. <laughs> but, but yeah, any of those writers will tell you when they hear me say things like, oh, what a wonderful experience the wire was. You know, David says, you were trying to get off that from day one. <laughs> And it, you know, it's not just because I'm looking a gift horse in the mouth. Or I, I, it's because it's, you know, it's emotionally taxing and no one in their right mind goes there if they don't have to. I talked to Mike Lee last week. Oh, great. And he said something that I wanted to start to talk to actors about, which is that he thinks it's it doesn't make sense that an actor would want to find a character within him or herself, which is almost entirely counter what everybody <laughs> has said on the show. Uh, even the week before that, I had l uh, amazing actor Lorraine Toussaint on who was talking about how she found the psychopath that she played inside herself. Right. Even the psychopath is in there, she said. Can you talk about that how that touches anything in you how you reject that thought or how you well it's been long an ambition and a thwarted ambition to work for Mike Lee and I think a lot of actors who know the process um, would give their eye teeth to work for him and I've talked to several actors who have done the process including one Janina Bivitsky who I remember which film was it? Secrets and Lies, I think. One of those films, anyway, where he, she was, you know, she went through the whole process. It's a two-year process of of um, developing this character, then developing an entire family, then developing a whole story of improvisation and shooting that story, improvising for two years, and the whole thing being cut out of the final film. You don't hear about that part. Uh, no, you don't. I mean, my my, he, and I've auditioned for him two or three times and I, I, I've always said to him, look, I just, that's all I want to do is work for you. And, and anyway, it hasn't happened yet. He doesn't want me. <laughs> so, um, and now unfortunately I can't really give up two years of my life. Yeah. But um, he's interesting, Mike Lee, because he's an astonishing, astonishing filmmaker. And I, some of his films I just love probably more than any other films. Some of his films I think are, uh, are fail for, for the same reason that the other ones are good. Yeah. And, yeah. and I think where it doesn't work is where it feels cosmetic in some way, where it feels like the external has been, it's tacked on and it's been yes, exaggerated. That's a good way to and say when, it. And when you yeah. see Ewan Bremner in Naked going around, Maggie! You know, he's going, Maggie! And I talked to him, you, and I said, how did that happen? He, he said, well, I, I just started, you know, I was going Maggie. And Mike said, crank it up by 10 times. And I go, Maggie! And he go, no, no, crank it up by 100 times. He go, Maggie! And he say, no, no, crank it up by a million times. He goes, Maggie! And this massive yeah. exaggeration works. It's right, amazing. It's right. electric. Right. And then you see other performances and you go, ugh, it's too much. I, I don't believe it. It's not founded in anything inside that person. But I think it's bollocks. I, I, I think yeah. what I think is great about what Mike Lee does is he, he gets you to think of a, someone you know or a bunch of people you know. And sometimes you, uh, 
amalgamate a bunch of people into one character. And, and so it is outside of you, and that's always reassuring for an actor. You don't really want to show your guts. You don't, no one wants to cry, no one wants to be emotionally open, least of all actors and least of all on screen. And so it's a good way, I think, of giving actors um, a way into a part uh, and, and of making them feel like they're pretending to be someone else. But I think it's very rare, I think it's probably non-existent that an actor touches an audience's heart when they haven't been expressing from their own heart, from, you know, when it hasn't come from within. And I think uh, however much his process starts from the outside, it has to be internalized for it to me have meaning. And so I think he's being a little disingenuous <laughs> when he says, um, what did he say? That, that he said he said it just it basically doesn't make any sense to try to find the character inside inside yourself. yourself. Yeah, I, yeah. I mean, you know, I, I you know, how am I going to find a, a a nun inside me or a um, a serial killer or a, a a man who wants to fuck his mother like Oedipus? You know, mm -hmm. uh, you know. Mm -hmm. But I played all those parts, you know, and yeah. ultimately you have to find it has to strike with you, something with you and and it does that through imagination and imagination is the opposite of ignorance and this is why acting and drama is so important because it's at the heart of um, compassion it's the heart of having the imagination to know what it feels like for someone else yeah. and if you don't have that imagination you are a psychopath you know you don't you psychopaths don't understand what it's like to be someone else, what someone else might be feeling. Um, and so in some ways, act, acting is the opposite of being a psychopath. <laughs> and, and I think that's where it has value. And, and, um, yeah. and, and therefore, and what's remarkable is that I can imagine what it's like to kill my father and have sex with my mother or to be, um, uh, I don't know, a... a, 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 a a king from prehistory who uh, is dividing up his nation amongst his three daughters. You know, the, all these things are no end, nothing to do with my experience, but they're everything to do with my human experience and our common human experience and with my imagination, my ability to imagine what it's like to be someone else. And, and I think, uh, I'm sure Mike Lee would agree with that, but uh, I think um, inevitably, a performance comes from within, and I, I, I'm certainly an actor who starts with the externals. I, I do, I do try and avoid um, looking at myself as much as possible. I think we all do. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I very much. And Olivier was another one who started with the externals, and you can mm -hmm. sort of see that now. You watch him now, and you can't quite take his performance. Mm -hmm. What's interesting is, in acting is, I think it dates far quicker than any other art form. I think, yeah, it, I think it goes out of date true. really quickly, and. Um, but certainly as a as an actor myself, I love to start with the with the externals and, and with Jean Valjean it was all about hairstyles and mm -hmm. it was all about what, what uh, Jackie was doing with my hair, uh, which is such a superficial, trivial thing to say, but it's actually was, was the starting point. You've got to start somewhere. Does it also help you that you have to do accents so much? Is that kind of like an outside in kind of thing for exactly. you? Exactly. That's, yeah. that's the most obvious and, it, and it's and it's certainly been true in my career and uh, and yeah, I mean, you to do an accent, the mistake is to make it this cosmetic thing you just slap on after everything else. It has to be at the core of your being, how you sound. And, and very often that's, a, that's why it's a very good way of getting into a character. And can you just tell me a little bit about that? Because, because what you just said there, people might be like, wait, what? I don't understand that. I thought it's just something I slap on. <laughs> yeah, well, I, 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 think, I think I, that's what I've done most of my <laughs> I, you just slap it on, you yeah. know, and, and certainly, certainly with episodic TV, it's just too exhausting to go around um, doing a Daniel Lear Lewis and being in character the whole time. Idris tried it on the wire, and I think he did quite well. But mm. I tried it for about a couple of days and and couldn't. I didn't talk to anyone, so um, I mean, you know, by assuming the, the accent. Um, so uh, yeah, I I. Um, I I do slap it on, but... <laughs> so you're <laughs> saying that you don't take your own advice. Well, uh, no, after, <laughs> now I have quite a lot of experience yeah. at it. I, I can say um, that it only works really mm. 
I mean, you, you do learn how people sound, what, how, what noises, sounds people make in an accent, but actually there's an enormous amount of variation in an accent. And, mm -hmm. and um, so you've got to find what's the inner impulse, what's, the, right. what's at the core of it. Kind of marry it to something else than just this superficial thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. it's very much part of the character. I think mm -hmm. accent is character. On these TV shows, I'm imagining there's no time for rehearsal. Uh, movies, most movies don't have rehearsal, but you come from the theater, you know? I mean, yeah. is that something that you miss or do you don't see much point in needing it? I did miss it. I, 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 when, I, when I started doing film, I'd done theater and then I started doing films and I really missed it. I really thought, oh God, how, how can I, um, you know, how can I get into this scene if I haven't done it a few times? And then I worked with Julianne Moore, who was uh, who said she learnt all her acting on a soap opera, and um, hmm. uh, and she never. We did a film called The Forgotten, which uh, was quite aptly named, and <laughs> 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 uh, but it was amazing for me because I've admired her for so long, and. Um, she would never, never, and that was the first time I remember thinking, fuck, she's not rehearsing, and she never wanted to rehearse, and I said, I think I must have asked her, and she said, you know, I'm not going to, why am I going to cry? It. Why am I going to, yeah, it. give up yeah, yeah. my emotion when the camera's not rolling, or is not even in close-up? Yeah. And, and, and having done a lot of screen acting since then, um, yeah, I wouldn't dream of giving all the goods until I know it's gone close-up, because A, I'm lazy, and B, you know, you might dry up. You know, run out of run out of the goods, and and the the beauty of film and why it's so different to theatre is that it's you capture an unrepeatable moment. I mean, you do in theatre too, but you capture an unrepeatable moment that's never going to happen again, and that could never happen in the same way again. And therefore, you have you have the liberty um, not to. You know, you do a bit of preparation. You learn the lines, but. Uh, it's much more interesting to discover these things on screen, or it's much more profitable. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and and I find now I've done loads of TV acting. I, I've become very, I've become very efficient, very economical, and very lazy and quite jaded. And um, so when I go back and do film, which I, I did a, a film with um, Kira Knightley last year, and she was saying you're very quick. And <laughs> <laughs> and, and I don't think she meant it as a compliment, but <laughs> but I I do I do uh, I do sort of hit hit my stride in take two or three, and after that I'm done, you know, because mm. I've done so much telly. And then I did a, a film called The Square with Ruben Osland, which won the Palm d'Or, an amazing film, an amazing director, and he does thirty takes minimum. Mm. He does ten takes before he even switches the camera off. Oh, God. And that I found outrageously annoying. You know, I just thought, how dare you have actors, not me, but um, the actor Terry Notary, I remember he who does this incredible performance as a sort of gorilla. Oh my God, so that was like take 30 with that thing? That, and which is such a physical performance. Yeah. And I remember after, and, and such, you know, a 20 minute scene. Yeah. And I think we must have done it two or three times and Ruben said, uh, okay, now we switch the camera on. <laughs> and I, I, and I, I'm sure I think he had the camera going, but yeah. I think he sort of said it to piss us all off. I think, but Terry, consummate professional, didn't you didn't bat an eyelid. And I went, that's a disgrace! How dare you not have the camera on? So uh, Ruben was very challenging in that way, and challenged very much my jaded, uh, episodic TV um, work right. process. You know, he he. Uh, and, and, and showed me the value of, of doing 50 takes. He really did. He, he you know, I, I initially thought, well, it's, you know, it's because you haven't worked with, with professional actors. You know, you need 50 takes to get a, a, you know, someone off the street to, to act well on screen. But, but no, he, he, he did it deliberately to break down a, a professional actor or any, any sense of professionalism that you have. And, um, and I think it has its place that. Obviously, you couldn't run a TV show on that basis, but... Yeah. Um, it was an, a very valuable lesson for me that uh, that 
to rediscover the importance of repetition. And that's all it, you know, the French call rehearsal repetition, and it's just repetition. And mm -hmm. in all walks of life, in anything you do, you usually benefit from repetition. Mm -hmm. I was watching that film with the guy who climbs El Capitan, you know, oh, yeah. the free climber. Yeah. And you look at it at first and you think, God, how did he do that? And of course he did it through endless repetition. Yeah. And that's how we get good at anything, it's repetition. Right. Anything that knocks you off kilter right. is a good thing. And I think as an actor, you have to do that to yourself. And mm. as a director, it's a very good idea. Anything that, you know, the, the, the most common one and a very useful one, and one that I think all actors love, I certainly do, is when they say, okay, we've got it, now you do one for yourself. Right. Now this is a free one. Right. And that sort of takes the pressure off. And, right. and that's a great one to say, but anything that, slightly knocks you off your premeditated ideas is has the chance of being really interesting it has the chance of being crap but right. um you know any way of in some way undermining so i don't know i mean I, I don't know the the trouble with directing and i, I notice this myself and I, i'm a i'm 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 quite a good director but i'm a really bad director of actors huh. and uh, and a very bad teacher of acting I noticed trying to teach my daughter um, I'm just not a very good teacher because I haven't got the patience but um, the, the hard thing is that everyone's different isn't it that, that, that all actors require different things and and uh, I love concrete line readings you know I mean, it's anathema when I was sort of training that uh, a director would come up and tell you how to say a line and then a friend of mine worked for Peter Brook and he said, I said, what's he like? He said, he's just awful. He just tells me how to say the lines, you know. And uh, I worked with another great director, theatre director, Peter Gill, who did exactly the same thing, just tells you exactly how to say the lines. And I thought, fuck this, you know, I'm an actor. I, I, I decide how to say the lines, you don't. But actually, it works. Well, I you know, it A, gets them what they want, and B, it uh, saves a lot of time, and C, it kind of fucks you up and annoys you. And that can, that can produce interesting things. Right. Dominic West, thank you <laughs> for this. I hope we can do this again. I hope so. I really want to listen to your other interviews. Please uh, do. I think yeah. you'll enjoy it. I think I, what I an really, archive. What an amazing yes. collection. And, and now we've uh, entered another leaf on the tree with you. Thanks a lot, man. It was a real, real pleasure. Awesome. Back to One is a production of Filmmaker Magazine, which is a publication of IFP, the Independent Filmmaker Project. Listen to back episodes of this podcast at filmmakermagazine.com or wherever you get your podcasts.